Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. We're going to prepare a three unit anterior bridge this afternoon, utilizing the maxillary right cuspid and the maxillary right central incisor. This patient had uh, large diastema between the two central incisors and so through orthodontics the two central incisors were realigned. This is a procedure that we use very often in aesthetic anterior bridge work. We realign teeth to better draw of abutments or realign teeth so that we can minimize the display of gold or give us some advantage in potic placement. Both this patient and his brother have congenitally missing lateral incisors and as a result, the two central incisors have spread apart and there is an uneven spacing between these teeth. The procedure in orthodontics was to fully band these teeth and bring both central incisors together to close that space and rotate the cuspids. The cuspids were turned quite a bit. They were rotated so that they would line up better as abutment teeth. In doing this then, we have space gain for a lateral incisor ponic on each side. After a year of orthodontic treatment, the two central incisors have been brought together, so now there's no more diastema there, and the cuspids have been rotated now to give us optimal placement for the facings. The space isn't overly large, but still will be able to get a much more aesthetic end result this way than if the orthodontics had not been completed. The radiograph of the cuspid shows the pulpal architecture. You'll notice that the pulp is mainly confined to the center portion of the tooth, giving us plenty of room on either side to drill our pinholes. On the central incisor, you'll note that the root is very short. For some reason, it did not develop completely. The root was this shape before the orthodontic treatment. And you also note that the usual pulp horns that we do see in a central incisor are absent. And there has been some recession of the pulp, again giving us plenty of room to drill our pinholes. We'll be utilizing a unilateral pin ledge for the abutment retainer on both the cuspid and the central incisor. With these plaster models, I'd like to show you briefly what we're going to be doing we will make an initial cut with an inverted cone diamond going from incisal to cervical and then by turning that diamond at right angles we will make our initial cuts to the enamel at the level of the incisal ledge and the cingulum ledge. Following this we will reduce the lingual surface, sharpen the incisal ledge and the cingulum ledge. And then a slice will be placed on the distal surface. And when that is done, then the finishing line will be extended around to the notch that was placed with the inverted cone diamond. With a 170L carbide then, the ledges are refined and then small recesses are placed in the areas where the pins will eventually be drilled. Following this, the little dimples are placed in the areas to allow a place for the twist drill to seat and to drill. Also, the incisal edge has been protected and beveled. And lastly, the pinholes then are drilled in the three spots on this tooth, the incisal pin to three, a depth of three millimeters and the cingulum pin to a depth of two and a half millimeters. We have placed an elastic or rubber band around the two central incisors. Because of the orthodontic movement, the teeth are very mobile, and I'm afraid they're going to drift apart. So during the procedure, we will leave this elastic on until we take our impression. In order to mark or to know where to place the incisal ledges, it's a good idea to use a bowling gauge to determine 
the thickness of the tooth where these ledges are going to be placed. And the way this is done is the Bowley gauge is set at two and a half millimeters. And in setting it at two and a half millimeters, this then will mean that where we place this Bowley gauge on the tooth, that at that point where it binds, that point where it binds, turn your head this way, perhaps you can see it a little better. At that point where it binds, the tooth is two and a half millimeters wide. Then if we take a half a millimeter off the lingual surface, the lingual reduction, and make a ledge a half a millimeter, that means that we have one and a half millimeters of tooth structure left. And the reason this is important is if you thin this enamel out too much, then the gold will show through as gray, and it makes a very unesthetic looking restoration. We then will take a little bit of graphite or pencil lead and place that on the end, on the tip of this Bowley gauge, and just scribe it across that incisal edge of the central incisor and the cuspid. And we do that like so. And what this will do is make a faint line that I will darken, and then I will show you this uh, in a mirror. With the pencil, I've darkened the lines that were scribed on the lingual surface. And you can see the level of the incisal ledge. I've also then marked the level of the cingulum ledge and the extent of the mesial finishing line. We'll be running a inverted cone diamond then up this mesial surface. On the cuspid, we've also darkened that line and made a mark on the distal surface and then area for the cingulum ledge. We will start the procedure with an inverted cone diamond. And we will run this up that mesial groove that we have scribed on the central incisor. Now we have to be careful when we use this diamond that we don't thin out this incisal portion of that cut too much or else again the gold will show through and give a grayish appearance on this incisal edge. Also, this cut will be deeper than the rest of the lingual reduction uh, in the preparation of this tooth. The purpose being to give us a, a ridge of thicker metal to give us some strength to the casting. Once that cut has been made, we will turn the diamond at right angles to that cut, and then we'll scribe and just go through the enamel on the incisal edge and the uh, singular ledge. Okay, can you see that? Mm. Then we'll move down to the Single on the ledge. This diamond can also be used to roughly reduce the rest of the lingual surface. However, we're going to be using a torpedo-shaped diamond for this purpose also a little bit later. Now just clean this mirror off. Now we're going to do the same thing to the cuspid. Now does that show? Can you see that? Turn it over this way just a little bit. Okay. You pick that up. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Now we turn it at right angles.
to establish a proper finishing line on the mesial of the cuspid and distal of the central incisor, we will put the patient's temporary partial back in his mouth. First, we'll have to remove our elastic. So that this temporary partial and orthodontic appliance can be placed back in the mouth. This is an appliance that the patient wears to retain the position of the, of the teeth. I don't think we're up. I feel like it's seated all the way. Mm -hmm. Do you want to close on it? Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Open. Now this can be done with a ground-in facing or frequently patients with a, a missing tooth, an anterior tooth, will have a temporary partial or a flipper that uh, we can use as a guide. <clears throat> and we will place a pencil mark on the mesial of the cuspid and distal of the central incisor. And of course, if we made the finishing line out that far, the gold would be too far out to the labial surface and it would give an unnecessary display of metal. So that we will then make a second mark, okay, about a millimeter back of this. And you can see both of the marks in the TV screen. And now I will place another mark just behind that about a millimeter to the lingual. And if you will turn this way, I think you can see that. And now we'll do the same thing with the cuspid. Place that finishing line a millimeter back. And then we'll try to erase the first line with a large eraser like this, it's a little difficult to do, but you can see how mobile this central incisor is. You will place the temporary partial back in to see if those lines are going to be hidden when the facing is put in. You have just a little bit of the pencil mark showing at the cervical, but we will modify our finishing line so that won't show. Now the purpose here is to get the gold lingual enough so it doesn't give an un unnecessary display of metal, but yet bring it out far enough so the patient can clean this gold margin with his toothbrush. Okay. The next step then is to take our, turn over this waist a bit. Six ninety nine dash nine long diamond, and prepare the slice and blend that slice into the lingual of the tooth, and then end that in the groove that we have placed on the lingual with our inverted inverted cone diamond. Okay, Martha, I'll open just large as you can open now. We'll just come up to that finishing line and then bring that around the cingulum and stop in that little groove that we have prepared on the lingual surface. And now we'll do the same thing on the mesial of the cuspid. Turn this way just a bit. Okay. Open as wide as you can. With this diamond, the finishing line on the lingual surface is carried just into the gingival crevice. Now I'd like to show you the lingual surface of these anterior teeth. 
to give you an idea of what we have done. Okay, turn this way just a little bit. Oh, okay. We prepared the slice on the mesial of the cuspid. We brought that finishing line around to the little groove that we had prepared on this distal lingual. On the central incisor, the slice was prepared on the distal surface. The finishing line brought around on that lingual, and then it ends in this little notch at the very cervical that serves as an indication to the lab technician that that is where the preparation ends. Now I would like to reduce the lingual surface and protect the incisal edge with this diamond. It's a small torpedo shaped diamond that is used for reducing the lingual surface. And by carefully rolling this along the lingual surface, about a half a millimeter of this lingual enamel can be removed. You have to take care that you don't reduce this too much. As you recall, we want the mesial ridge to be deeper than the rest of the preparation. With the same instrument, we will slightly bevel the distal edge line angle here. And then we will protect the incisal edge by slightly hollow grinding that very edge of the tooth. And then we'll move over to the custard and also reduce that lingual surface, taking about a half a millimeter of that lingual surface away. And then again, making our incisor protection, hollow grinding the incisor so we have a bulk of metal on the lingual surface. We've reduced the lingual surface end of the central incisor and the cuspid. About a half a millimeter of enamel has been taken off. We also have protected that incisal edge. You can see, can you close just a bit? All the way down. It's a good idea to check the clearance. <clears throat> we should have two thicknesses of 28 gauge green wax as clearance on the lingual surface. Open just a bit now. now. Also on these incisal edges, you can see the type of bevel that we've placed on this, that the gold will be on the lingual surface, and we have not brought the finishing line out to the labial, but we've hollow ground this incisal edge so that there will be a bulk of gold to protect the thin, delicate incisal enamel, and yet you won't have a display of a lot of metal when you look at it directly from the patient from front on. Now we're going to take a 170L carbide and refine our ledges slightly and place some recesses where we're going to drill our pin holes. Open just there. That's it. I need some air on this too, Michael. Okay. These recesses need not be very deep. And you'll notice also that the placement of the recesses and pins are quite far apart. We gain stability in these pins by having them 
far apart like the legs of a tripod. This mesial recess and pin should be tucked way into the mesial surface of the, of the tooth. If it's brought too far to the center of the tooth, then we will probably get a pulp exposure. Now we're going to change carbide tips and we're going to place a half round dime, a half round carbide on this to make little dimples where we're going to drill the pin holes. Now we're going to place the <coughs> dimples in the little recesses that we've placed on the lingual of these anterior teeth. This happens to be a number one round burr. You can use either a half or a number one carbide. And the purpose of this is just to make a seat for the twist drill when we do drill with the twist drill. The twist drills do not drill well through enamel, so it's very important that these little dimples are drilled through the enamel. <coughs> now I'd like to set up the paralleling device and show you how that will be used to drill our parallel pinholes. There are many ways of paralleling these pinholes for this anterior bridge. One is to use guide pins and then by eye line up each succeeding pin. There are also many paralleling devices on the market. This dental guide is one device that we are going to use on this patient. I'd like to very briefly show you how this device is set up to fit the patient's mouth. A study model of the patient's maxillary arch is placed on this surveyor and then the actual arm of the paralleling device is placed on this mounting surveyor and the contour angle handpiece is placed in the uh, paralleling device to line the burr head up with the little pin <coughs> that you see right here. This then parallels the burr with the mounting table. When this is done, then the model is lined up so that you have the optimal line of draw with your handpiece. And the model can be changed back and forth until <clears throat> the line of draw is exactly the way you want it for your preparations. Then the model is locked on the surveyor and then this entire thing then is turned around so that we can then mount the model to the, and relate the model to the paralleling device. Now this is where the handpiece was and then this part of the paralleling device then is placed on the model with a small tray. And then with a former tray plastic that's placed in the tray. The teeth are lubricated and then this is placed down on the model and a index of the occlusal surfaces then will be recorded on this little tray. Then this can be taken to the mouth and then this will relate the maxillary arch to the contour angle and anything that we cut then will be parallel and it will be in the same line of draw as we have on the model here. Now I'd like to take this paralleling device to the mouth and show you how the contour angle relates to the anterior teeth. A portion of the paralleling device that we have made the acrylic index for goes on the maxillary arch. And we'll place this in position and have the patient close on the bottom portion. Now the bottom portion of this uh, can be lined with compound if you need the extra room. I close on that. In this particular situation, I think we'll have enough room. And then our 
counter angle then will be related to the paralleling device and any cut that we make then all the way along here, all the way to the post here, would be parallel, would be parallel. Now, we have to make sure that we're turning this twist drill in the proper direction. And once we start drilling with the twist drill, we don't stop in the tooth. We go to the depth and then pull it out. But we never stop a rotating twist drill uh, in the tooth. We'll start with this distal incisal pin. Once we start rotating the, the twist drill, we should never stop it in the tooth, but always bring it back out again. And we'll move to the mesial, bring the pin, the drill in and out, and then the cingulum pin, and then we'll quickly move over to the cuspid, mesial of the cuspid, distal. And then the cingulum pin. And then we'll take the paralleling device out and check the depth of the pin holes. The incisal pin should be three millimeters deep. And the cingulum pin, two and a half millimeters. And we have just a little bit to go on the cingulum pin, and we will have that uh, on the central incisor, and then that will be the proper depth. And the mesial pin on the cuspid has to be deepened a little bit. For that, we'll place the parallel device back in the mouth, and then we'll be ready to take our impression. Okay. Again. We have the impression pins in place, and the patient has been tissue packed. We will now take our rubber base impression. We have uh, rubber base already mixed. We inject this around the tooth and open real wide now, please. Into the crevice and around these pins. These the steel impression pins tend to float up in the rubber base impression so that we uh, have to make sure that we have them seated all the way. So before we take our rubber base impression, it's a good idea to tap each one of those to make sure they're seated all the way. That one I can't find. There it is. Okay. And also in the fabrication of the impression tray. You have to make sure that you relieve it enough in these areas where the pins are, because if you don't, there's a good chance of bending these pins or perhaps cracking the thin enamel around the uh, around the pin holes. Now we remove the cotton rolls and seat our our tray. And we'll wait until the rubber base is set. Rubber base is set now and we'll remove this impression. Some of the pins may remain in the, the tooth. On deep pins this very often happens. So we have to check very carefully, and a couple of them did. This is no problem. Before the patient swallows the pins, open please, the pins are placed back in, into the rubber base impression. These are perfect cylinders, and they are all of the same length so that uh, they are interchangeable. And so if the pin does stay in the tooth, we simply remove it and place it back into the impression. Now let me show you then the impression. I'll try to turn it sideways after I place this pin back in. Uh, 
if you can get a close-up of that. You can see we have the three pins that are parallel to each other and the three pins in the other preparation that are parallel to each other and we do have uh, a good impression of the cervical finishing line all the way around. Now this impression will be silver plated and all we have to do now is temporize these teeth. The bite is such that there is no occlusion on these anterior teeth and we will be able to hand articulate the models. All we'll have to do now is take a shade and temporize the anterior teeth. We'll place cotton rolls back in the mouth and then we have Williams plastic pins that we have placed in a little bit of utility wax and these will be placed in the pin holes so they seat all the way. Utility wax around the Williams plastic pins acts as a seal. Oh, there go. There it is. And we'll seal this pin like a cork in a wine bottle. When you're handling pins, it's a good idea to use a hollow beak pliers. These pliers tend to hold the pins a little bit better than, than uh, just a regular plain cotton forceps. And we'll do the same thing to the cuspid. Is that saliva ejector jammed up? Mm -hmm. I need a saliva ejector here, my thinking. Yeah. Can clean that up. So once these pins are placed in the proper position, then a Duralay will be painted around these to lock them together and to temporize this until we have the patient back to seat the bridge. Okay, the brush. We make a very, very thin paint on mix of, of Duralay, a little bit of liquid and a little bit of powder and join the three pins together. And when this has then hardened and set up, it is polished with a little rubber wheel. The occlusion is checked. We make sure that the incisal edge is protected and we'll bring this doorway right to the very edge of the tooth to protect this delicate incisal edge while we're fabricating the bridge. And then we'll dismiss the patient until the bridge is completed. You can see the Williams plastic pins through the Duralay temporaries and they have held up quite nicely. We have Duralay built up over the incisal edge to protect that delicate incisal edge. Now these temporary crowns will be removed using a 26 spoon and you place the 26 spoon at the very cervical and tug and uh, they usually come out in one piece and if the pin does break off as one of them did you can very easily take it out with the spiral and tulo. The cuspid's coming out a little bit easier. When we last saw this patient, we had taken a rubber-based impression. Today we have the fabricated anterior bridge, and we uh, have already cemented the facing. The shade has been checked and the contour. We will try the bridge in before cementation now to make sure that 
the margins are correct. You can see we have burnished over the platinum pins and this has been polished. And the margins all seem to be adequate. So we will remove the bridge and then a mix of aluminous EBA cement will be made. You can start mixing, Judy. As you can see, these pins are very retentive. It's important that the pin holes are completely dry, so we will take some paper points and make sure that we have these pinholes dried sufficiently. When you're using EBA cement, aluminous cement, we uh, do not use a varnish. Okay, you can set that right down here. Because we want the zinc oxide eugenol to be in contact with the tooth tissue here. We will spin the cement up in the pinhole. Go ahead, yeah. I'll do down low. That's it. Right, right near the slab. And by using a spiral and tulo, open real wide, huh? spinning the cement down the spiral, you'll get cement up in the pinholes. So be careful you turn the spiral in the proper direction or else the cement will be coming out of the pinhole rather than down into the pinhole. Cover the pins too. Okay. One more pinhole to go. Okay. Now we simply seat the bridge with a little bit of pressure and use an orange wood stick. Okay. Now, close, please. Now this zinc oxide eugenol <laughs> cement but rather quickly in the mouth, faster than the zinc phosphate cement. So give you a little bit of working time. The zinc oxide eugenols will not set up very quickly on the slab, but once they have moisture and warmth, they will, uh, uh, cotton roll please, they will set up very rapidly. Okay, close again. Okay. I need to, uh, you're getting saliva here. Okay, okay close. Close again. Okay, close. Mm -hmm. Now, let's just close real tight. Open. That's, that's it. Just keep your teeth together. Now, we'll use a Tano number one plastic instrument. And this can be used as a burnisher. And open just a bit now. The surfaces of the gold that are exposed can be burnished with this Tano instrument or a 5S burnisher. Now once the surfaces that are visible, readily accessible, are burnished, then this bridge, under pressure, close please, is allowed to set for a period of 10 minutes. When the cement has sufficiently hardened, it's important to remove the cement from around the bridge, especially under the soft tissue and under the potting. It's a good idea to take a dental floss with a bridge threader and thread underneath the potting area, and uh, also instruct the patient on how to thread dental floss under this potting area to make sure that they can maintain the cleanliness under that area. You'll notice that when we look at this bridge from straight on, tip your head down a little bit, that the way we have prepared our incisal protection, that the 
display of gold is minimal on that incisal edge. And when we're talking to this patient in the conversational position, that this gold doesn't show at all. And yet, when we look at the incisal edge, you'll see that there is sufficient gold protecting the incisal edge. It's a good idea to recall this patient then in about a week to check the oral hygiene and to recheck the occlusion and see how they're getting along with the bridge. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.